session of the Hana Rent Center. Today we're going to be talking about Hana Rent's essay, The Crisis in Education. Um, we're going to actually read the entirety of this book, uh, Between Past and Future. Uh, and let me say why we're starting with the crisis in education. I'm not entirely sure. This is actually um, one of those things where somehow we had announced that we were doing the crisis in education. And then we had decided to read the whole book. And instead of starting at the beginning and moving forward um, out of some inertia, uh, <laughs> We, we're, we're, we're starting in the middle, but we may actually do a special session and read it again as we're reading the book um, because it is so tied to what comes earlier in the book, uh, especially the essays on um, what is authority and also the essay on, um, the, on tradition and the break in tradition that comes earlier in the book. Um, but uh, for now, uh, it does stand on its own. Um, it's actually one of my favorite essays of Hannah Arendt, largely because I'm an educator and um, I find it to be one of the most provocative and um, reflective pieces on what it means to teach and to educate. Um, I hope you've had a chance to read the essay and uh, to listen to the, the video that we sent out about it. Um, uh, as our as is our practice here, I'm going to largely open it up for for questions. Um, let me just say, uh, there's a lot of things I love about this essay, um, but the 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 the, the essay, what it most does to me, the most provocative aspect of the essay um, for me, is this question of what it means um, to take responsibility. Uh, for the world and to um, love the world uh, if you're going to be a teacher. And so on the final page of the essay, when Hannah Arendt writes, education is the point at which we decide whether we love the world enough to assume responsibility for it. Um, I take that to be uh, a, a real challenge to all parents, as I am, and educators. Uh, and I think the 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 premise here is that if you don't love the world enough to assume responsibility for it, to defend it in some ways against the onslaught of the new, um, you're really not ready to be a parent or an educator. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't also recognize that part of the world is that it will change and that trying to hold it in place and the word that she would use here in German is erhalten, um, is a mistake and it will lead to the ruin of the world. Um, and yet you have to be willing to hold the world in its being. In sein zu halten is the German that she uses. This is an essay I should say that was originally written in German and um, translated uh, by someone else into English. And there are a couple of translation mistakes in the essay. Um, uh, the most important ones intellectually are on page 189, uh, which I mentioned in the video, in which she three times uses the word to preserve in the text. And yet in each time, the German word is different. Um, so um, the first time in which we erhalten, we hold the word world in a sense fixed, um, that is dangerous uh, and as, as an educator. But um, the world will wear out, and we have to hold the world in its being, in halten, in, in sein zu halten, in its being to hold it. And that, she says, is important. But then most important at the bottom on page 189, right above uh, where it starts section four, she says, exactly for the sake of what is new and revolutionary in every child, education must be conservative. It must preserve, and the word here is bewahren, to guard, to hold, but also to hold in truth, wahren, um, uh, uh, to preserve, but to hold a truth in its preserving, to preserve or bewahren or guard this newness and introduce it as a new thing 
into an old world, which, however revolutionary its actions may be, is always, from the standpoint of the next generation, superannuated and close to destruction. And so to be a teacher or a parent, you have to love the world enough both to guard it, to preserve it, to hold it, but also to let it change because that's what the world does. And it's this balance as an educator um, that I find uh, compelling and, and also challenging. Uh, so often today we see you know, conservative groups saying education should just teach what is or reading, writing, and arithmetic. And that's not bavar, and that's not guarding the world in its in the fact that it's also new. It's a kind of a halt. And we see the liberal or progressive group saying we should teach, you know, for enlightenment and change, radical and radical emancipation. Um, and that's also, I think, ignoring part of what it means to love the world and take responsibility for the world. And as so often is the case, Hannah Arendt sort of pushes in between these which is not to say she finds a happy medium, but she she sees the ways that both of these these viewpoints um, uh, don't do justice to the idea of education. And so, from my point of view, um, in the end, for her, conserv education is conservative to practice in conservation, but it's also revolutionary. It's an exercise in letting young people grow into adults who will remake the world uh, and return it to its principles. Um, and it's this conservative revolutionary aspect of education as she understands it, which very much informs my own thinking about what it means to teach and educate young people. So um, having now given you a video uh, where I explain some thoughts about this and now given the short introduction, um, I'm happy to have us have a conversation. I should at least um, uh, recognize, I see on the list, uh, welcome Helen uh, Gunter, who's uh, one of the leading thinkers on, on our rent and education. And uh, it's nice to see you here. Um, or she may have popped off. Anyway, uh, open up to conversation. Anyone have anything to say? Please put it on your mics if you want to say something. Uh, <clears throat> Harold here. Um, hello. Thank you. Uh, I have not read the rest of this. And uh, the question that came up for me, uh, I also really uh, appreciated uh, this essay uh, and her 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 attempts, but I'm not quite sure when she uses the word authority, is she using it to mean moral authority in the classroom and in the political life? Or maybe you could just comment on what authority means since some of us probably haven't read the other essay. Thank right. you. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Harold. So yes, and, and as I said, by reading it sort of out of order, that is a disadvantage, and we will come back and reread this essay as we read the whole book through. Um, uh, authority is a, a very important concept in Hannah Arendt's work. Uh, she thinks it largely doesn't exist anymore, uh, at least in the political realm. So she begins her essay, What is Authority?, with the line, I probably should have called this essay, What Was Authority? Um, but uh, in its most basic form, she distinguishes authority uh, from um, violence or persuasion as um, that ability or that 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 um, uh, belief in the need to obey that is neither compelled by violence nor by persuasion. Um, it's simply what is. Um, known to be uh, um, authoritative. Um, you don't have to, if you're a, if you're a practicing religious person, um, the, the authority of God is not something you have to be persuaded to. 
you have to simply take it on faith, at least in many of the world's religions. There may be some where that's different. Um, uh, so if you read Augustine's Confessions, one of the constant struggles he has is that he has to stop trying to persuade himself that God has authority and simply take it on faith. And that's one of the hardest things for him. Um, uh, and on the other hand, um, if there is an authority in God, you don't have to be forced to do it by punishments or whatever. You should simply obey God um, because you recognize his authority. Now, maybe there's no, it never been an absolute authority where there's been no need for anything else, but there were many uh, in, 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 in history, Arendt thinks, there are numerous examples of cultures and political worlds and religions um, in which uh, authority exists more or less. Um, the Enlightenment is in many ways uh, an entire movement uh, which is the beginning of the end of authority. The premise of the Enlightenment is um, I obey nobody or no thing or no authority that I can't understand. Right? And so um, uh, I am an emancipated, uh, enlightened individual. Authority has to be rational. And it's this very need to rationalize authority, to make it into persuasion that um, from our end's point of view, erodes and potentially ends authority. And so, um, as we'll read in, as we go through this, um, this text, which is a great text, the first main chapter uh, after the preface is called uh, Tradition and the Modern Age. And it's about how the modern age replaces the authority of tradition and loses the authority of tradition. Um, the essay, What is Authority?, is about uh, how authority was important predominantly as a political concept in ancient Rome, but has lost that importance. Um, and the essay uh, later in the text uh, on, on the crisis in culture is about um, the loss of uh, cultural and political authority and how that leads to uh, a crisis in politics. The essay, The Crisis in Education, uh, is about um, the loss of authority in politics and how, especially in the United States, in which the uh, idea of equality is so important, the loss of authority not only means that we no longer trust and love the world without persuasion, so that we can't just assume that people love the world. It's also the case that the teacher-student relationship in which the teacher has authority over the student becomes questionable because why does the teacher have authority? Why do older people have uh, any greater insights than children? Uh, we live in an age right now in which, you know, the cult of the young is paramount, whether it's in business and the internet, um, or in politics, uh, or in, in education, this idea, and she talks about it in this essay, that we, 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 uh, we elevate play and doing as more valuable than knowing and, um, and learning. And so uh, it's this cult of the young, um, which suggests that there's nothing valuable in itself about what is old traditional, carried over from the past. And um, that authority of the past is now always questionable. And to the extent it is going to be respected, it actually needs to be rationalized. That's the crisis of authority. And for her, um, there's uh, two reasons at least that education needs authority. Uh, one, uh, the teacher needs to have authority over the students. And two, the teacher has to love the world. Um, and in loving the world, they have to, in some sense, think that the world, as what has come before, has some authority and claim to be loved, uh, even if people find it to be lacking 
unjust in many ways. That doesn't mean we can't seek to change the world, but we can't not love the world. Uh, you know, put this in a, in a, in a, in a contemporary context. Um, there's huge debates right now around um, the national anthem, right, in the United States. Uh, should we sing the national anthem in sports events and other things? And there are arguments that, you know, the national, that the country has problems. It's unjust. We shouldn't be proclaiming our fidelity and love for the country at a time when it is unjust. Uh, the other side of that is um, we can recognize the injustices that exist, but not uh, have to throw out the fact that the country we live in is one in which we can try and address those unjust injustices and have a tradition of doing so. It's a debate people are having, but there's a, on one side is the idea that the author, the country has an authority and is something we should love and we should take responsibility for loving it, teach people its principles, hold them in trust, but also hold them in truth in a way that we try and live up to them, which will mean to change the country. And the other side says, there's no authority that the country has unless it's just. And I won't proclaim love for the country until we make it just. Two very different viewpoints. And I, I think that's very much what Hannah Arendt here has in mind um, with this idea of authority. Um, Harold, if you want to follow up, you can. Other questions, comments? Oh, that was uh, that was uh, very uh, helpful. I I found lots of <laughs> lots of underlines in this uh, um, essay, which uh, actually uh, one uh, I found uh, very interesting was one can take it as a general rule in this century. That whatever is possible in one country may be in the foreseeable future equally possible in almost any other. I thought that really sums up what's going on, although well, not directly related to education. Okay, great. Um, I see a couple of questions in the uh, in the chat function. So um, the first one is from Kathy uh, Benedict. Um, I can read it, and Kathy, if you then want to add on, you can. She writes, her construction of common sense seems to be reactive to the times. What was education working at previous to progressive education? Out of the factory model of the Bobbits came the idea that students shouldn't be objects of education. She's reacting against the laissez-faire model, which was extreme progressive education, perhaps bordering too closely to socialism. Um, Kathy, do you want to add to that at all, or or, or leave it at that? Well, I it's it's so um, it's so important that for me that I read her in the context in which she was writing, and this this her extreme conception of progressivism was I think modeled in many ways by many people who were worried that this laissez-faire, anything goes model was chipping away at society. And when she wrote this in the early 50s, America was in huge turmoil. Um, Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, the alleged fairness and equality in, the, in the, what was taking place, and then Sputnik. And I, I think her worries of, she seems c continually worried that we're not teaching enough and and it, what you said something very interesting when you were when just now when you were talk, talking you said we eval we evaluate play and doing as more valuable than knowing and learning or she believes that that we evaluate 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 you were use the word evaluate uh, play and doing is more valuable than knowing and doing which was which was very Dewey and very engaged, learning and doing were very engaged. So it's hard to tease out how she's thinking about these issues without thinking about the context in which she was writing. That's that really, that's my comment. 
Great. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, so let me say I didn't in the video, I didn't talk so much about the second section. Um, and, and, and I didn't, and, and, but it's, it, and it's important. And Kathy, I think has it right. She's responding in the second section to particular, uh, debates that are dominant in the mid 20th century. And let me say they continue. I mean, uh, they're, they're slightly changed. The, the vocabulary changes. I mean, we have this thing of phonics and reading, um, right now through the common core. If any of you have students or kids in school, like I do, um, you know, my kids spend more time learning to write about what they're doing in math than actually learning math sometimes. I mean, they have to do a math problem and write two paragraphs about how they did it. And it's not always clear to me what that's about, but that's the new model of, of math learning um, that, that's going on. Um, so uh, she is here um, talking about uh, the crisis, right, um, of, of, of education. And there's, she says there's three assumptions in it uh, which are underlying this crisis. Um, one is the this distinction between the child and adult. Uh, two is that um, teachers should learn to teach as opposed to becoming qualified in a subject matter. And three is this question of um, replacing work with play. Um, People who read this and have a strong background in progressive educational, you know, work recoil, right? There's no other way to put it because as Kathy said, she has some, she's taking a somewhat extreme version of the progressive argument and, and criticizing it. Um, she's not really trying to get involved in these debates over that per se. Um, but she thinks that these three, um, assumptions are all based in a common uh, grounding in this idea of the loss of authority. Um, uh, and the one that Kathy was talking about here, about playing and doing versus learning, um, is for her, you know, problematic on many levels. But in the end, um, what she thinks is that we have to um, part of what education is, is leading children into the adult world. And um, that means at some point teaching them, guiding them um, into the habit of working and learning. And um, while there are many things that can be learned by play, right? At some point, one has to learn by work, by studying, right? You can get to a certain level by playing, but um, at some point you have to learn to work. And uh, her worry here is that the overvaluation of, of play over, over learning and working um, is infantilizing. Now, I mean, in the first, second, and third grades, maybe that's not so much of a problem. In high school and college, uh, it's more of a problem. And, you know, it's important to understand that she thinks of her work here on education as going through college level, um, stopping there and not, and it's probably in the middle of college. It's at the point where you start to specialize. She thinks you're no longer dealing with education. You're teaching or learning something else. And she makes that distinction. Um, but so, for, so she uses the example of, of um, learning a language. And to the extent that many colleges now have adopted this immersion language program um, in which we don't teach grammar and we don't teach the principles of the language, but teach the language through speaking. Um, her point is that at some point, that's not the way adults learn and that we should be um, teaching older children, especially um, through a, a more rigorous work-based uh, account. Um, this will obviously be very controversial in the, in the pedagogical world. Uh, um, the, I think the deeper point, if you want to tie it to the, the elements of her essay that are important in that way, um, concerns how this embrace of play, uh, is part and parcel of our distrust of authority, our distrust of teachers 
our distrust of the idea that there is a grammar of the language that is set, that has authority, that should be learned in a rigorous way over and against the sort of Umgangssprache, the, 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 the English, um, the slang and the, the way we speak in a day to day basis. And, um, uh, she's, uh, she sees that, uh, elevation of the slang and the day to day and the play over the rigorous learning of an authorized, structured linguistic system as indicative of the uh, loss of authority that um, we suffer. Um, Kathy, you also talked about common sense. Let me just say, uh, uh, common sense is a is a is a important word throughout Hannah Arendt's writing, um, and it has to do with um, that which is common and which we share in common, a common world amidst our plurality and differences. And uh, um, in many ways, the entire uh, activity of politics is about um, articulating and learning to accept a common sense while not insisting that we give up our particularities and pluralities and differences. Um, and education in it so far as it asserts that there is a common world that we share and that is lovable and valuable is about teaching people what it is that we share in common amongst our pluralities and differences. And so from a political point of view, education is absolutely essential. Um, not now, she says in adult world, you, education is dangerous and we should never bring education into the adult world. So whenever people say, you know, we can, we can solve our partisanship problems or our problems in politics by better information and educating voters, or the current word is civic education or voter education, Hannah Arendt's allergic to those terms because that smacks of tyranny for her. That smacks of saying, oh, we can educate the voters. That means making them think what we think. Um, uh, but for children, education is obviously a deeply important uh, activity uh, in that it makes them share a common world that even if we disagree, if we're so Republican or so Democratic or we're Trump supporters or Hillary Clinton supporters or Bernie Sanders supporters or Gary John supporters, what education teaches us that we can all be those things and still love the common world that we share. And that's very much how she understands the common sense in education. Okay. Um, I see a question from Kentaro. I mean, if people want to interrupt and comment on any of this, I'm happy to, to take comments. Um, as well. I don't want to simply answer questions, although I'm happy to do so. Happy to have a have people interject here. Other comments? Thoughts? I'd like to interject. Yeah. I'd like to interject as Jack Hirschfeld. Um uh I'm I'm intrigued by Kathy's comment about placing this uh essay in the context of its time because um it was a, it was a time when I was in the midst of being educated and um and my thoughts about it are that at that time uh there was very widespread dis uh discomfort with the outcomes of education that uh the the, the term crisis in education was widely believed to be you know there was a, there was a popular sense that there was a crisis in education because children were not being educated properly. Now, I can't remember a time since then that people haven't felt the same way. But back then, there was a lot of experimentation going on, which I think is what she's referring to, the Bank Street School and so on. And, and I think about the opposite approach, there were opposite approaches to the question of how to introduce tradition. On the one side, there was great books, which basically said, we already have what we need to know. We just have to read these books. Um, and then on the other side, there was Black Mountain and even Bard College, which 
took the approach that um, the learning is a democratic communitarian experience and that the work of education includes actual physical labor and, uh, and connects to the everyday work that people are engaged in, not only um, reading and study. And, um, and those are, if you like, extremes that were both being pursued at the same time uh, because there was a, a, a lack of clarity about where does authority lie. And it was kind of like a widespread search for where it's the appropriate authority. So it's, it wasn't only um, uh, Hannah Arendt who was struggling with this. I think it was a, a very deeply, um, uh, a deep concern in the entire, uh, if I can call it education community. I don't know that there is such a thing, but in the entire world of people who took education seriously. And um, uh, I'm reminded, or I, I remind myself that when I went to Bard, Bard was a place which was relatively, you made your own curriculum, but there was still some curricular rigor and there was a common course, which was the way in which everybody connected to the tradition. Yes, thanks, Jack. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, sh yeah, I should say that her, Hannah Arendt's husband, Heinrich Blucher, helped create the common course. And uh, it was very much um, uh, driven by both of their ideas uh, that education in many ways is about not specialization, still at the undergraduate level, but about um, learning to know and love the common world that we share. And that's very much what the tradition of the Common Course is about as it still exists today. Um, Patrick, you want to say something? Yeah, I did. Uh, can you, is my mic working, Roger? I, I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay, good. Uh, well, I want to uh, agree with Kathy and, and uh, Jack mentioning uh, the fact that, uh, and you mentioned it also, I think, in your earlier comments, the previous uh, video, about not really defining the crisis she's addressing or being very specific about the symptoms. She's talking about causes and, and stuff, but she doesn't really mention what the results are. She does mention the issue about why Johnny can't read, as I recall in there. Um, but I think uh, uh, laying so much on the pedagogical issues, she misses, I think, she mentions the issues of educating in a mass society uh, where you have so many diver you know, diverse uh, populations and so on, and also educating the immigrant uh, uh, population, uh, which, uh, which seem to make, that, those are the parts that seem to make sense to me. But the two issues that she doesn't talk about basically are the problem of poverty, the impact of poverty on education. And as you alluded to in previous comments here, she doesn't separate the differences between elementary, high school, and college education, which would mean slightly different models, I would imagine. I'm not an educator, but I assume uh, there would be diff some differences. But I'm sorry she doesn't mention the, the problem of poverty and more, say more about how do you educate people in values over a diverse uh, community. And, and I think authority, uh, a lack of authority is, doesn't seem to me to be the only uh, problem there. Right. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Patrick. So let me say, um, uh, she speaks uh, about this question of equality um on pages 176 to 177 um and the 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 premise here is that uh in England for example where they've opted for a test to get into college um mm -hmm. they they have embraced what she calls a meritocracy uh which will of course she says lead to an oligarchy not of maybe 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 a wealth or birth, but of talent, uh, if at least if it's applied fairly. Um, whereas in America, she says, such a test would be um, unacceptable and um, that meritocracy contradicts the principle of equality. Um, and 
Uh, she then says that equality as a basic principle of education, which is core to America, has great disadvantages and great advantages, right? And the disadvantage she offers is the cost of the teacher's authority and the expense of the gifted among students. So that if we try and teach everyone equally, the gifted may get short shrift. Um, and, but the great advantage, she says, um, uh, um, is, is there as well. Um, uh, and she doesn't articulate it, um, but says it has a humankind and also educationally speaking as well, in that it um, brings everyone into the common world and not just those with the birth or the money to become educated. Um, uh, whether our public schools have lived up to that hope, uh, I don't even think we can say is an open question. Um, I think it hasn't. And I think one of the great, you know, people often talk about uh, this fact that 50 years ago when they were growing up, they got a great public education. Why can't public schools educate kids now? And I think one, there's a lot of ways we can answer that. But one is think about the vastly more diverse uh, student body we're trying to educate right now. The schools are integrated as opposed to segregated. Um, there's many more, um, there's a much greater effort to include everyone in our school systems. Uh, and, um, and it's just a much different beast to educate today uh, on a mass level. We're failing it, clearly failing it. And um, uh, we need to, to take that into account. Um, but Arendt isn't, you're right, is not in this essay talking about poverty. Uh, and in general, she doesn't talk a lot about poverty, which is uh, a critique people make of her. Um, she does make a distinction, we should at least note, between misery and poverty. Uh, uh, and what she says is that people who are poor can still engage in the public world, be visible, uh, go to school, and um, live uh, a public and citizenly oriented life. But people who are miserable, who are so poorly off that they basically don't appear and are invisible in the public world, uh, can't. And um, she doesn't think being poor is a political problem, but she thinks being miserable is. And I think we have, a, at least in our country, have a problem with misery, not only poverty. And I think that's the distinction that's worth um, worth maintaining in our public discourse. Um, there was something else you mentioned, Patrick, but I forget what it is. I apologize. Uh, you got I, will, I don't remember either one. <laughs> yeah. I, I will bring up one question about the, this idea of political questions and so on, because I think it comes just to keep the children away from political questions, which he reiterates many times over. And it always seems to me that a child is engulfed in, in political values and so on, depending on where they live, depending on where they go to school. And if you're going to get parents to be involved in many of these uh, social issues, that's a political education itself. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised she's so adamant about avoiding political, to, but which, which to me includes values, uh, why she seems so determined that they should be separated from the child's education. I, I always found that, I, I always find that to be an odd. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure where she says what you're saying. She says, she says that adults should not be educated, right? We should keep education out of adults. Um, I don't think she says we should keep the political out of the child's education. What she, now, she, what, she would, what she does say is that the focus of education should be teaching about the world as it is, more so than as we want it to be. So we shouldn't be going on and saying um, in class, I want, we should create a Marxist utopia, or we should create a, a, a right-wing state. Um, 
the role of the teacher is not to, in a sense, indoctrinate students with a certain politics. It's to teach them about the common world as it is. But that's not at all to say that students shouldn't be exposed to politics, both in history and in the world. Um, in fact, she says that we, the, the boundary between the adult world and the ch children's world is, is always fluid and the children have to be exposed to parts of the adult world, but done so from the educational model, which is not about indoctrinating them or arguing which one is better, but of teaching them about the world as it is and loving the world. So that's the distinction she makes. Um, it's not about, I mean, we include politics in the curriculum. We just don't make education political. I guess that's the distinction. Can I make a comment? Yeah. Um, it seems to me that there's so much that's just omitted from this discussion. Um, let me, I'm, what I'm thinking right now is about the, the discussion of Eurocentrism in education that's been, I think, since the time this essay was written has become a much more prominent uh, issue. And if you read Hannah Arendt, there can be, in my mind, no doubt that she's firmly committed to Eurocentrism. That that the 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 founders of that you just go, everything goes back to Plato. I happen to agree with her. I don't have a problem with that. But this is deeply under attack in today's society under because of the the rationalization of of um, c colonialism, imperialism, whatever name you want to put on it. But I'm saying that some real fundamental questions here that she kind of sidesteps and implicitly assumes even the whole notion of authority the authority she's thinking of is the authority of the Western tradition. Her notion of, of authority is the auctoritas of Rome. And uh, it, that, I think that's what really makes this thing so complicated because all of the layers uh, that, uh, that are in today's discussion would be things that she would have to fundamentally attack. I'll stop there. So, yeah, thanks, Paul. I mean, uh, so, there's different parts of that conversation. So on the one hand, um, Hannah Arendt in this essay, and I think outside of it, um, uh, is clearly making the case that education uh, has to orient itself towards the old. That doesn't mean it ignores the new at all. And in fact, part of the old is that it will always change but it oriented towards the old. And so she says on 174, uh, about halfway through the page in the middle of this paragraph that begins, all this is by no means the case in America. She says the political role that education plays in a land of immigrants, the fact that the schools not only serve to Americanize the children, but affect their parents as well. That here, in fact, one helps to shed an old world and enter a new one. So in America, we're not just entering an old world, we're also um, shedding an old world and entering this new world. Encourages the illusion that a new world is being built through the education of the children. Of course, the true situation, so that's not true, that we're building a new world, is not that at all. The world into which children are introduced, even in America, is an old world that is a pre-existing world constructed by the living and the dead. And it is new only for those who have newly entered it by birth, that's actually left out in the translation, by birth or immigration. They, they leave out birth. Um, but here, illusion is stronger than reality because it springs directly from a basic American experience, the experience that a new order can be founded. Um, so I think there's a couple things to take from this. One is that uh, Hannah Arendt would, not would, clearly says she is in favor of what at Bard we call a common course, what around could be called a great books course, or um, the idea that part of education is teaching people about the living and the dead worlds reading dead authors, learning about a world that has been handed down to us. 
and loving that world. So um, that's indistinct. That's, I think, indisputable. Um, what that world is, is something that every new generation has to uh, figure out. And uh, I, uh, I think clearly Arendt's world that she was brought up into was a world of, of, of Eurocentrism, if you want to use that term Paul used. Um, I don't think she's committed to that. I mean, if you look at her writing, especially as she gets older and is more Americanized, she begins to branch out and read many uh, different authors that she had not read and taught and thought about um, when she was younger. Um, I think, you know, we're having this discussion at Bard right now around the Common Course. We've made a, a, a strong decision that we will only allow dead authors in the Common Course. But we're also trying to find authors who um, are part of what we consider to be a common world, but maybe um, not exclusively part of the European tradition. Now, many of them are, and we still read many of those European authors, but we've added other ones. Um, now, I mean, you know, you take someone like Gandhi, who's now in the common course. This is a man who was educated at Oxford, but he has other experiences. Is he part of the Eurocentric model? That's a good question. But whether or not he is, it's clear to me, who suggested it, right, that Gandhi is now part of our common world in the West. Um, and I don't think, and I think it's something that, you know, we all are enriched by knowing about and actually informs the world we live in today. So um, in many ways, I think the Eurocentric debate is a bit outdated. Um, I think it was a debate that happened in the 80s and 90s and others. I think, to me, the core curriculum should be held onto. Great books should be taught. But we can have a really interesting and important debate about the great books and the core curriculum. And uh, I don't think it's limited to um, uh, in any one uh, period. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that if you look at our world today, um, the traditions of Greek and German philosophy and of the emergence of natural science in Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries um, have had an enormous and outsized impact on our world. And that, does, and, and that means that those texts have to be part of and maybe even a major part of a common course. But that doesn't mean that there are other voices um, Ralph Ellison is in our common course as an American voice, deeply classically educated, who brings out a part of the common world that is often ignored uh, by some of those texts. And uh, to me, these are important um, arguments, discussions to have. And I don't think in any way Arendt's work uh, um, suggests that the common world has to be a European world. And there's nothing in her text that would suggest that to me. Um, I think what she reminds us is the importance of having common texts, common worlds. But I think what that world is will grow. And I think that's, that's why she, when I talked about the three uses of preserve on page 188, I take that very seriously. She says, education is, is in its essence conservative in that sense of conservation. But she says that conservation can be dangerous and lead to destruction if we hold on to it simply as, you know, conserving some dead letter. Um, we have to also understand and preserve what she calls the newness and introduce it as a new thing into the old world. And um, I think Arendt sees the importance of both of those sides of that. I would just point out that if you just look and see which uh, thinkers Hannah Arendt references in her work. If you count the number of references to Plato, the number of references to Marx, the number of, of references to thinkers in that tradition, and compare the number of references to thinkers outside that tradition, from what I've seen, that number is zero. Oh, well, it's not zero, Paul, but it's, it's much less. So let me, let me say Hannah Arendt was educated in Germany 
in the 19 teens and 20s into the ninth early she ended her education in 1930 right and so she has the education she acquired and there's no doubt that that's the world she came out of i one of the brilliant accomplishments and geniuses of hannah arendt and it's one of the things that very few people are able to do is that she loves that and she's unapologetic about that and yet she's smart enough to realize in her in her own terms that part of what um happens to the world over time the world that she read the european world is that it changes that new ideas emerge new revolutions emerge democracy emerges uh science emerges and you know if you think about what uh luther read versus what max weber read very different um, because the scientific revolution changed what people read, changed what people thought was important. And um, so the, the point is not that Hannah Arendt didn't, re you know, yeah, Hannah Arendt was a product of a particular period. Um, all I'm saying is that from an Arendtian point of view, we today should have discussions and debates and arguments about the bounds of our new world as it exists and as people are being born into it today. And it would be shocking if that world were the same as the world Hannah Arendt was born into 110 years ago. I mean, it would be 110 years ago, almost exactly. Her birthday's this week. Um, it would be, to her, a disaster if that were the same world, because the world changes and we have to understand that. That doesn't mean we ditch the world, but we understand that it changes. It seems, I'm, I'm one of the things I might be hearing Paul say is that, and, and that I'm not hearing said, is that the common world was made common by a very particular group of people. And it, and that com and that we're not often we do not hear the voices. The reason we have this common world to which you, to which you and aren't speak is because they had the privilege of becoming the common world. And I'm sure you have this conversation at Bard. But I think that one of one of the issues with the young students in the national anthem is that they 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 do not see a common world. And in fact, I cannot read Arendt without in my mind saying the only common world we share now is the world that we are polluting, the physical world, because I am I just cannot wrap my head around the concept that the common was erupted and emerged out of of only a group of people that could forward that common world. And and I absolutely applaud that Ralph that we're that you're reading other authors and i'm not saying there shouldn't be a common core i just want to know that you're having the argument or the discussion of who decided common even when aren't was thinking common yeah i mean so yes you have to have this conversation and the common will always change um you know uh you know from an Arendtian, I'm just going to be, you know, from Arendt, what she's saying, and I and I happen to think she's right. Just to, to say that the only thing common is that we're polluting and destroying the world, which is a bad paraphrase of what you said, Kathy, and I don't mean to, is is for her a problem insofar as that it doesn't address the 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 world as something wondrous and lovable. And you may say, well, there's nothing wondrous and lovable in it. Um, and she thinks that that's a necessary opinion to have to teach, to bring young people into the world. Um, uh, why? Uh, I think the answer to that is, is that there's, we bring people into a world that we've made and to simply approach that world as a critic, to simply approach that world as something awful that we that our ancestors made, but we um, will not. Um, a, uh, I mean, from a political standpoint, is a mistake because by putting ourselves as such outsiders, we'll never be able to understand other people in that world, many of whom love it, and we'll never be able to actually uh, 
have a community that can discuss about how to change the world. But um, it's it's more it's 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 a it's a kind of uh, Macbeth washing of your hands. It's a kind of not addressing the fact that we come out of that world, um, and that the true world is one that can accept the critique of it, but also understand that the critique came out of it, we came out of it, and that that world is um, has produced many great and wonderful and brilliant things. Uh, and and she thinks that that's imperative uh, as an educator and a parent to um, both see both the love of the world, but also its failings. Um, you know, whether there is a common world today in America is an important question. Um, I, I, I will be very clear. I think there is. I think that there are. I think we have to do a much better job of talking to others who are very different from ourselves, who see the world differently. Uh, both we who are white and male and teaching, but also uh, young uh, protesters in the streets need to talk to us and hear other sides that they're getting as well. Um, I don't think it's a, a one-way street. I don't think one side is right and one side is wrong. I think the reality of the world includes all those perspectives. And we may judge some perspectives better than others, but we first have to hear and listen to and try and understand those perspectives. And that's the Arendtian understanding of plurality and politics. Um, that is, uh, well, actually, we'll get to when we read the essay Truth and Politics in this volume. That's the premise of that essay. Um, and, and, and we'll get there. Um, we have only a couple minutes left. Let me read one or two of the questions that have come in and see if I can say anything about them. Kentaro asked um, that Arendt rejected derivatives and opted for the way of the rebels. Uh, so it's a, she was against any kind of uh, uh, philosophical tradition that thought that there was a, a philosophical truth that was valid for politics at that point. But she says in this article, she's ad advocating the conservative way of education. So I don't know. I, I think what I've tried to say, um, Kentaro, is that she sees education as a project of conservation. Not as saying this is true, um, but that this is what was, and that this is a world that has given us many great things, and we should respect it and learn to love it, even if it's wrong, uh, even if there are problems with it. And, and that's, I think, the attitude of conservation that she has. We should understand the world from which we come and that in which we live. Uh, and we can only really change it if we do. Um, and if you try and change it without understanding it, you're not going to get very far. Bob is asking, I'm having trouble grasping the concept of loving the world. Yeah, we all are. In a famous exchange with Gershom Sholem, who accused her of not loving the Jewish people, she agreed with an explanation that she didn't love any people. Um, is this a contradiction? Um, I don't think so. I mean, when she, when she says, I don't love any people, um, I love my friends, is what she says. Um what she's saying is, I'm not, as Hannah Arendt, going to identify as a Jew or as a German or as an American and say that I love all Jews, because there are a lot of Jews I don't love, um, and a lot of Germans I don't love. Um, but what she does – okay, so is it a contradiction? Maybe it's a slight contradiction. I don't know. I'd have to think more about it. I don't have a lot of time here. But I think what she's saying in this essay, Bob, is um, – we have to love the common world, not the Jewish world or the German world or the American world. But let's use America as the example. We have to love the world of America, which includes young black people protesting, white people in universities and police officers, uh, women uh, protesting about certain things, uh, women in pantsuits being CEOs, men uh, doing all sorts of things. We have to learn to love the world as it is in its plurality, to see that whatever it is that we have with all of its problems came out of good impulses of human beings um, trying to do interesting good things, sometimes failing, sometimes doing bad things and failing miserably. But we have to learn 
what what is and what has been before we can hope to judge what should be. And education is largely governed towards learning what is and what has been. Politics is about learning how to judge. And we shouldn't, judging is not something you can teach people. It's something that people learn by doing it and by example, by seeing examples of good judgments and aligning themselves with it. Um, and, uh, but education itself is about preparing people to love a common world. And it's a, I will tell you, Bob, when I started this discussion, I said, this is to me the most provocative and important part of her work, which doesn't mean it's the easiest or the clearest. Um, when I teach, uh, you know, especially when I teach the common course at Bard, there's a lot of material in it that is material I wouldn't normally teach. And I don't particularly find, I find it wrong. My job in it is not to say this is wrong. I, there's, I never say a critical thing about the people I'm reading in the common course. My job is to teach these students what is great about all these texts. What is the what can we all, from all different perspectives, find commonly interesting in these texts and moving? And that's how I understand um, the common course. Um, and uh, and it's a very difficult uh, project. Um, I know there's other questions coming in. Um, let me, uh, family, some, some people asked about privacy and family and education. It's the last thing I'll talk about. She, it, 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 this is a very interesting part of the text for me. For those of you who were at our conference last year on, 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 on what, why privacy matters, um, her discussion of privacy in this text was, was, uh, was, was a, key component of that conference. Um, and what she says here is that uh, children are largely um, uh, part of uh, the private life. She says on page 183, everything that lives, not vegetative life alone, emerges from darkness. And however strong its natural tendency to thrust itself into the light, it nevertheless needs the security of darkness to grow at all. And I think it's a brilliant line, and I, I think of it as a creator or as an artist. If you're always in the public realm, bombarded by opinions and what other people are saying, you're never really going to have an original thought. Uh, and this is true of a lot of artists. They say they have to retreat. They have to be outside the world um, in order to really come up with something unique and new and their own. And, and I think it's true in that sense. But what she's also saying is, we owe it to our children to keep them out of the public for a certain amount of time, to keep them in the dark. Because in order to be grow up and have your own opinions, to be a self-thinking individual and not someone who merely parrots what is out there, um, you have to you have to have the time to grow up without other people telling you what you should think. And this comes back to the political, you know, nature of education. It's not that education can't talk about politics. It can. But the worst thing you can do for kids is to tell them, you know, you have to vote for Hillary or you have to vote for Donald or you have to be an environmentalist. Um, and there's this idea that a lot of people have that this is the time when it's easy to indoctrinate kids in being environmentally responsible or socially responsible or anti-prejudice, I mean, anti-bullying, and my kids are getting a ton of this stuff in school. And, you know, I, I have mixed feelings about it, because on the one hand, you know, I want my kids to be uh, nice and not bullies. On the other hand, I think it's the, it's their ability to retreat and be in darkness um, that allows them to become self-thinkers. And this constant uh, attempt at indoctrinating um, publicizing them, preparing them for public by telling them what they should think and do, um, can be very destructive, uh, to children when they grow up and are now being told by what they do, not by teachers you like, but by political people and, uh, corporate people and others. So I think we may regret our efforts to indoctrinate children young in life as they grow up. Um, and that's 
why she insists that we hold on to an idea of education that protects young people um, from sort of overt political and public uh, uh, doctrines. Uh, we're out of time. I, I, I thank you all for, for hanging in there. Uh, it was a good discussion, and um, we're going to start at the beginning of the book with the preface to the book um, for next month. And by the way, I should say our conference is coming up October 20th and 21st. I hope to see you at BARD. If you can't get there, though, it is live streamed, and you can watch it on the Internet. Thank you all very much, and I hope you continue to enjoy reading Hannah Arendt.